Let's, let's pray appropriately for today. It's always appropriate, but especially today when we're talking about prayer. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this day. We thank you for your provision to us, um, your upholding of us in all things. I pray that you would go before us now, that we would uh, learn how you have invited us to know you better, and, um, and that we may grow in the practice that you have modeled for us in our prayers. Here, I pray these things. Amen. So, um, prayer for the world is our discussion today, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's an easy and small thing, of course, so no worries. I'm going to cover it. Five minutes, we'll be done. It's good. Um, I was actually reflecting on it even just, just a moment ago. Uh, it's, it's a little daunting when you think about the fact that, in fact, Jesus was the one who instructed us how to pray. Um, but it also, and I've always enjoyed this about uh, teaching Sunday school, particularly this year, has been that um, every time I study one of the topics or anything in that vein, uh, you get the opportunity to see a little bit more broadly how the church and how uh, people outside of yourself, of course, have understood and experienced uh, any particular topic. And one of the things I found kind of, uh, it was bizarre to me, but it also makes sense when you when you think about it for a little bit, is that uh, the, the one of the most common reflections about prayer is that it is not a natural thing. It's an awkward thing that we feel almost uncomfortable with prayer. And so I think it's a, a fantastic thing that we are going to sort of talk about what prayer is and how we pray for the world in particular. Um, to that end, and, and that's why I, I began with uh, a prayer, a, a piece of a prayer that we all know very well, um, that thy will be, be done on earth as it is in, in heaven. Um, it was an impactful sentence. Um, but the idea uh, being that as we are learning to pray, that um, as we're going to talk about in a moment, that our prayers are not something that we are making up ourselves, but they are something that we are uh, following a model of and are uh, supposed to be leading towards a, a particular end. Um, and that end finds itself in the sovereignty of God himself. Um, so as we go through it today, um, my, my goal would be for us to cover sort of what sorts of prayer do we see um, in the Bible and as we practice. And uh, the five categories that, that really stood out to me, and I, I know it's, it's hard to say I've got a comprehensive list here because prayer, uh, the other thing you quickly realize the more you, you search it and explore it is there are prayers upon prayers upon prayers because almost everything can be covered in prayer, which is the beauty of it. But categorically speaking, I wanted to focus on these five. Um, the prayers for mercy, for those who may yet be saved, and, uh, and, and we'll go there first. Um, uh, some examples to think about, uh, Abraham praying for Sodom, and Jesus praying for those who were crucifying him. Um, two pretty uh, powerful examples of prayers for mercy, um, which are, I think, substantially different from prayers for salvation, which we'll get to in a moment, but, um, but are still fairly significant. <clears throat> prayers for judgment um, for those who are enemies of God and who have rejected the Lord. Particularly, of course, we're familiar with imprecatory psalms, um, but even uh, even all the way to the cry of the saints before the altar in Revelation, right? Uh, crying out, how long, O Lord, um, until you make this right. <clears throat> Prayers for salvation for those we are actively hoping to convert. Um, and... Uh, a poignant example uh, is, is Paul in Romans 9. Uh, prayer for the church itself. Um, most of these, you'll notice, have to do outside of the church, but then uh, pray, praying for the world includes, I think, uh, praying for the church in the world, um, as modeled again by, by Christ um, and by Paul. Um, and then finally, prayers of thanksgiving, which again, we're very familiar with. Um, extolling and, and praising the Lord for the things that he had done. So, any any thoughts or questions before we go a little deeper in? All right. So, <clears throat> before we get to that, 
I wanted to start with sort of the um, meta question of why do we pray? Why would it be something that might be awkward to us? And I, and I think really the, the thing that comes up over and over again is, um, can we impact the Lord? Can our requests, our entreaties, our praises, can any of it change sovereign God's will? That seems inherently wrong. Um, I, for example, cannot, well, how could I affect the rain today or not? Can, uh, <laughs> and the rain being such a simple thing, could I actually save somebody with my prayer? Could my prayer affect the salvation that God has ordained from the beginning of time, right? Over and over and over again, Scripture uh, reminds us of how sovereign the Lord is and how, how God has all things uh, has in all things, planned all things, ordained all things, um, and yet we are invited to pray, and to pray and then let our hearts be known to him. And so a, a big question is, why would we pray? And, and what sort of prayers should we pray? Um, a favorite prayer as I was reflecting on this, one that comes up over and over again is, uh, what was sort of loosely described as the Jesus prayer, right? Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, this is the full version of the prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. A very basic, simple entreaty, identifying our Lord and requesting something. Um, and I think that's where, when we look at the, the sort of heroes of the faith that we have, going back into time, all the way into some of the first centuries, and then of course even up to, uh, for example, Martin Luther, in the, as he's as he's leading the church into a, an era of reformation and uh, pulling us away from uh, the, uh, a church that had led us away from scripture, uh, Martin Luther helps us understand a little bit more about what prayer is for us. Specifically, he says that the holy scriptures cannot be penetrated by study and talent is most certain. You're not going to get it. The good and the true and the beauty that is there, uh, you will miss. Unless, of course, God brings you to it. Therefore, your first duty is to begin to pray, and to pray to this effect, that if it please God to accomplish something for his glory, not for yours or any other person's, he very graciously grant you a true understanding of his words. For no master of the divine words exists except the author of these words. As he says, they shall be all taught, of God. You must therefore completely despair of your own industry and ability and rely solely on the inspiration of the Spirit, which is um, both liberating, I think, and terrifying because, of course, and I think Luther felt that tension, uh, it means that unless the Lord calls to us, unless the Lord moves in us, we are hopeless. But thanks be to God, He has called us, He has moved. And he has made his, his will and his truth known to us. And so our duty is to pray so that we might know. Um, the other, the other uh, fantastic thing there is to point again that it's for, uh, it's for his glory, not ours. And so part of our prayer and our practice of prayer is teaching us to remember what and why things happen. Or for what reason and to what end these things around us, these events that we pray for, why are they happening? Am I praying for my own glory, that I might achieve this end because that would be awesome for me and I would love everybody to know how great I am? Am I praying for this end for my, my town, for my, my, my nation, my whatever it is? Or am I ultimately praying that God's uh, glory would preside in the world as it should, right? that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what is our role in prayer? Well, Jesus, speaking to the disciples, reminds us, right, prayer is a safeguard for us. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is in, indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so prayer is there given to us specifically as a benefit for us. Our role in prayer is as a patient receiving medicine. 
we are getting the health that we need rather than guiding some force. This is not us invoking or calling, uh, saying the, the magic words that enable us to do things, but rather, uh, in many ways, we are being overwhelmed and protected by our gracious Lord and Father who loves us and has allowed us to know how to ask for his help. Why do we need to ask for his help? I love this. Origen, this is second century. Origen says, it's, it's beautiful and troubling all at the same time. Uh, Jesus, my feet are dirty. Come even as a slave to me. Pour water into your bowl. Come and wash my feet. In asking such a thing, I know I am overbold, but I dread what was threatened when you said to me, if I do not wash your feet, I have no fellowship with you. Wash my feet then, because I long for your companionship. This is the, and it is, this is where it gets so awkward. We are beseeching and requesting and asking, almost, almost commanding, come to me as my slave and wash my feet. Lord Jesus, who has saved me, who made me the word of God. Because Jesus himself told us, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. And so in that way, Origen is reflecting on the same horror that Peter had and that maybe we should have. That Jesus would kneel before us and wash our feet should be absolutely wrong in every way Yet he does, and in fact, he insists that he does. And if we do not accept, then we are missing it. That is our prayer. That's the very essence of how we pray. That we are asking the Lord, that we would presume to ask the God of the universe is blasphemy, really, when you think about it. That we would talk to him. That we would invoke his name. But that is what we are actually commanded to do. And unless we do it, we are falling short. So that is the task of prayer. And I want that as our bedrock because everything that comes after this has to be in that, that we are commanded to do the obscene, to make our requests known to God. And so we pray for mercy. The men turned their faces away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood still before God. He asked God, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And this is a, a, a crazy moment. It's the first time that we see in Scripture a solemn prayer asking mercy from the Lord. Reflect on that for a moment. We don't know if Noah prayed. It doesn't say. But it makes a point of telling us that Abraham did. Abraham asked for mercy for Sodom, which was not a good place which had it coming, and yet he asked for mercy. That's a tremendous testimony to the righteousness of Abraham. It also says something about what Abraham has learned about God. Will you actually destroy the righteous with the wicked? You're not supposed to be that God. And so Abraham has noticed something, and his testimony in his prayer he is testifying to the goodness that he knows of the God he has encountered, who called him out of the land of his fathers into a new land. The same God that has challenged him every turn, he's testifying to that because he's praying. His prayer reflects, you're supposed to be the God of mercy. And of course, <laughs> there, there is no greater crazy prayer and that Jesus is praying for mercy and forgiveness for the men who are crucifying him, who are dividing up his clothes as he hangs on the cross. Together, they paint a very vibrant picture, I think, for us to reflect on. Our prayers, um, do, they, do they bring God's mercy down? Another one, of course, I think that we can think about is Moses also entreats the Lord. The Lord is about to wipe out the people of Israel. He says, don't worry, I'm going to go down and wipe them out. And what does Moses say? Does anyone know what Moses says? Well, what are they going to say about you? Yeah. 
Is that what they'll say about you? It's a, gosh, it's awesome. The reflection is the people of God, including even the Son of Man, Son of God, reflects in his prayer a request for God's mercy not to be tainted by, by overstrong justice, by justice that is untempered with mercy. May it never be said of you, Lord, that you, did, that you destroyed the righteous with the wicked. Forgive them, they don't know what they are doing. Will they actually say you destroyed your own people? You brought us out of Egypt. Cyprian says, we pray and we entreat God whom these men and persecutors do not cease to provoke and ex exasperate, that they may soften their hearts, that they may return to the health of mind when this madness has been put aside, that their hearts filled with the darkness of sin may recognize the light of repentance, and that they may rather seek that the intercession and prayers of the bishop be poured out for themselves, that they themselves shed the blood of the bishop. Cyprian saying, we're praying that the persecutors who are caught in the madness of sin might be softened so that their prayer, so that they would turn from desiring the blood of our bishops to desiring the prayers of our bishops. But notice the, the role of the martyr, just like the role of Christ, and even the role of Moses and the role of Abraham all the way back, things change, of course, from Old to New Testament in how we pray slightly. We'll talk about that as we get to number two. But the role in all of them remains the same. They are not indicting the Lord particularly, so much as reflecting what they know about the Lord. And their prayers are consistently with their faith in the goodness of God and asking for mercy for those who, who desperately need it. They recognize, ah, you have failed. And the Lord is coming for you, and I would like to see you be spared because you are sick with sin. Any thoughts on this before we go on to the next? I have one thought. Yeah. With Abraham asking God to have mercy and to not slay the righteous, sometimes I think it's hard in our theology mm -hmm. when we start getting really black and white about it because you just think, well, there is no righteous person there because right. none are righteous. So then how can we even invoke yeah. that prayer right. of spare the righteous if there aren't any righteous? Right. So is that part of what gets us confused when we're praying is we... We overthink our theology, maybe? Um, I think there's that. We're going to talk a little bit about um, judgment, because that's coming up right out around the heels of this, obviously. Um, but I think I think you're right. I think so we get caught up in both. Um, there's kind of the prayer of, how, I mean, there's the struggle of, Lord, how could you wipe out a people? Why, like, how can bad things happen when you're a good God, right? But that, I think, is missing the necessity and the the... Um, fullness of God's justice too, which you know, we're going to talk about in a second. Um, it's, it is that balance, and we struggle constantly with the balance of justice and mercy. Justice must have mercy. Mercy can't be merciful if it's without justice, um, and we're struggling with that. How does he pray for uh, the righteous in Sodom? Um, and the most righteous man there, the one that's spared <laughs> Barely passes muster, right? But but there it is. A lot is spared. Is he talking about people that he believes are followers of Yahweh, or is he talking about people who aren't living in the extreme kind of sin that right. Sodom is being judged for, or is that maybe like another way that you could think about it? I think or? so. Yeah. I think I think there's that. I think there's also the yeah. I think I think there's the fact. Of course, when Jesus is praying, he does see through and know the heart of the men that he's he's asking for pardon. So in that case, I mean, it even goes all the way to that extent, right? Um, not assuming. And, and Cyprian, right? He doesn't seem to think really there's, there's really much good about them, but he's asking for mercy because um, it seems that in Cyprian's case, he's, he's attributing their failure to sort of the disease of sin, right? And I think in that case also, Abraham, he might not attribute the fullness of, every, of it to everyone, but he might also say, like, they, they, like some were the instigators and some were the followers, or, you know, etc.
My prayer is for judgment. We are familiar with these because we even sing them, right? We sing the Psalms and we don't cut out the ones that are hard to understand. We sing them through, which I love. It's the most beautiful aspect of it because they are part of the Psalms. They are part of Scripture. They're not given to us as this was a seasonal thing and not never to be sung again, which means we get to wrestle with the complexity of Scripture. And that's what we're supposed to do. Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name. Is he asking for judgment on the ignorance? Or is he asking for judgment on those who are rejecting the Lord? So, when looking at the prayers for judgment, I think there are a few things to, to consider about the way that they are issued. And also reflect, again, it's not just a psalm thing. It goes throughout the scripture. First, they're part of, uh, part of the order of worship in the psalms. So, they have a context, they have a placement, and we're not supposed to skip over them. We've already covered that, I'm not going to belabor it, just to say it. They are our imprecatory psalms against Israel and even the church. Not, not psalms, but prayers, right? If Israel fails to live up to the commands of the Lord, may we also suffer, and may his righteousness fall, fall down upon us because we have failed. And in the New Testament, we also see uh, instruction for if the church fails to abide by Christ's calling, may we fail and may we be receivers of judgment as well. It's not just everybody else. It is also for us because God's righteousness is good, not just a sword that we use against our enemies. It's also not for personal uh, vengeance. And that's a, that's a really big deal. David had enemies, but he didn't write imprecatory psalms about Saul that we saw, right? He didn't say, and may Saul. We don't have a psalm saying, Saul, the worst man ever, etc. He doesn't condemn Absalom. In fact, remember, when Absalom sins against his father, how does David respond? Huh? How does David respond? Hmm? He weeps. He mourns. It is, it is everything in him that wishes that this young man would not suffer in this way. Because he's doing the wrong thing. And the wrong thing will end badly. Because his son is going down the road of those who received the imprecatory psalms. But he doesn't want his son to, do, to, to end that way. It's not personal. It's business. No, it's not personal. <laughs> it is business. It's the business of heaven. But it's not for me. Human prayers are based on divine promises in this case. We have a lot of examples of this, but it is comforting to know that properly done imprecatory psalms are about us praying that God's promise that righteousness and justice would rule the land, that that be, in fact, fulfilled. It is not us determining right and wrong. It's not us meeting out judgment. It's not us balancing the scales. It's that we are asking that God would put things to rights. That God would make what has gone wrong correct. That is the prayer. The nature of it. It's also sparked by the horror of sin. It is in direct reveal, um, <laughs> response to the awfulness that we see. That when we see people, and right when we sing the psalms, uh, whenever we sing an imprecatory psalm, uh, it's always moving, I think, by the time you get about halfway through the psalm, they start to really go into the case of why I am praying this prayer. Because they mock you. They murder the innocent. They do not honor your laws. 
And we know what those laws are, right? Because the Lord has made them known over and over and over again. And as he, as he demonstrates, even in, say, Romans 1, those laws are natural. All men know them, and when you break them, all men are guilty. It's not just the chosen who have, been, who have had the revelation of Scripture to them. All men have some basic understanding that heaven is above them, that right is right, wrong is wrong, and when you break that, when you live in that world... You have put yourself as an enemy of heaven. And if you do that intentionally, over and over again, and continue to refuse to acknowledge what is right and what is wrong, and live in that way, then may the justice of heaven fall on you. Because God is a good God, God is a righteous God, and God will not be mocked. And that way they flow from a zeal for the righteousness of God. And you get that sense even of how zeal for your house feels Christ, right? We talked about this this two weeks ago. The zeal for his father's house drives Jesus in righteous anger to drive out those who have made a mockery of the temple. And he does not sin. Now we, you know, we have a harder time knowing how to do that in action. But our prayers are free in that way. We are free to express ourselves in that way to the Lord. And with zeal, ask for his righteousness to clean the temple, to clear the room of those who have continuously and without variance pursued evil instead of God's righteousness. He's rarely against specific people, but rather against the wicked, which goes back to the not personal justice. It comes after salvation has been rejected. It is with, uh, it is with very intentional re uh, reflection that um, those I'm praying against, again, they know, and they've chosen not. They have seen, and they have rejected which is, again, how we get into the place of horrific revulsion from sin. All right, we, we pray for the destruction of Planned Parenthood because Planned Parenthood has stopped a long time ago even pretending that they don't know what they're doing. We pray for the destruction of those who uh, martyr Christians because they know what they're doing. We pray for, right? We, we ask for God's judgment and justice to come on them because they have not fallen by accident into this case. And even when we go back to talking about Sodom and Gomorrah or uh, those who are crucifying Christ, um, there, there, there was a mistake for those crucifying Christ. How could you, I mean, how could you wrap your mind around you're, you're, you're going to kill God? Even in Sodom and Gomorrah, possibly there's the idea that you haven't, you haven't fully understood the wrath you've just called down on yourself, right? Although, of course, Sodom does not get off the hook, so. <clears throat> and finally, it usually includes personal absolutions. The prayer, the one praying for God's judgment, asks the Lord to search his heart and cleanse him too because we know that we are prone to error and if we have strayed in the, uh, in the earlier parts of this I don't want to pretend that my call for your justice is, is, is just pure me being holy because I might be angry too I want God's justice not mine yes or Islam, or whatever it might be. I mean, Psalm 83 is the imprecatory psalm that we sing. Yeah. And that all and the point of the condemnation or the destruction is that they may know that you are God alone. Yes. And that they may turn their face and seek and seek him. Right. So even in the midst of calling for destruction, um, we want destruction of the principalities and powers, uh, but we but ultimately we want them to be undone so that they might actually repent. Like Saul, Paul, and, and see mm -hmm. his face. But still love, still motivated. Exactly. 
No, and that's and that's the that's justice and mercy mingled together. <laughs> Prayers for the salvation of the lost. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. And what this comes down to is our role in participating in God's plan. Uh, Lewis says this beautifully in The Problem of, of Pain. Uh, you will certainly carry out God's purpose however you act, but it makes a difference to you whether you serve like Judas or like John. And that's a pretty stark um, juxtaposition. Both were disciples. Both served a purpose. Um, one, it would have been better if he had never been born, says our Lord. Paul again in Romans says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I had great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were a curse and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul is reflecting on what he's lost as Christ called him out of, the, out of his, his home and his family. Obviously, which is greater? His home and his family are Christ. Paul only has one answer. But he, he's testifying. How does his heart feel? And where's his prayers for his brothers, who he is now separated from? It's with deepest anguish, and only for Jesus could he do what he's doing. So our prayers for the lost are supposed to be motivated, and notice they also tend to be uh, specifically for people uh, that we know. Because that's a prayer that we are directing for the for God to work in this person's life. John Piper was uh, I was reading his reflection on it, and he was reflecting that again. This is one of those weird things. We know that the Lord has called from the beginning of time those who are His. So there's that. You know, why why even bother being missionaries if God's already ordained everything? And and there's so much to unpack there, and we don't have time for it all, but the, the simplest and biggest thing, I think, is to reflect, again, on what Lewis has said, right? You, you get to decide. It's for you to decide what your goal is in God's providence, because, yes, God's providence will, will be accomplished regardless of your decisions, but your decisions impact your role in his plan. Are you Judas or are you John? Which, again, I'm not pretending to have easily or simply expressed a divine and difficult truth that we can just walk away from. I'm just, does that make sense? We, we are right here touching on the mystery of God's sovereignty and man's free will. Uh, I'm not going to wrap it up in the 30 seconds I have for it, um, but do we understand the point? And as we look up from that, the role of prayer in that is to point us to, uh, we are, again, as... Um, as Luther instructs, our duty is to pray that we can learn what God has uh, ordained and that we may see our place in his, in his glory. Right. Any questions on that? All right. So prayers for the church in the world. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. This is Paul writing to the Romans. Paul, Paul prays so beautifully and so consistently in all of his letters. Um, it's one of the uh, most refreshing aspects for me every time... Uh, I read his prayers because his prayers are always asking us to pray for him and then reminding us not just to pray for him and not just to pray for ourselves, but reminding those believers to pray for the other believers elsewhere and to encourage them and even reminding them of specific good works that those believers are doing and to pray for their encouragement, that their courage would not fail, that their joy would be full, that they would uh, be Christ to one another. Upholding one another, we have not ceased to pray for you to be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. I do not ask 
for these only, this is, this is Christ speaking, and he's praying in the garden. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, meaning us, which is an interesting thing, because Christ is praying not just for his disciples, praying forward with the knowledge that you and I would be here today, and he prayed for us. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. And that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me. That they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. And in this, the example is kind of amazing. Not only is Paul praying um, above, praying for the concerns of brothers and sisters at that moment, but then we have Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who we are supposed to follow, who taught us to pray. And how does he pray? He prays also with a mind to what God is doing in time, that we may all be one. That we are praying for the church as it exists now and in the future. That his will would be demonstrated. That God's love, again, also notice that he's praying that the world would see your love for me and for them in how they are and how you uphold them. Because it, again, it testifies to who you are that the world may know. And so our prayer, the ones that we have modeled for us, our prayers are to both encourage now and to, to call upon the promises of the Lord for the future. Any thoughts on this? Prayer is our avenue to understanding the wisdom of God. Martin Luther again since the Holy Writ wants to be dealt with in fear and humility and penetrated more by studying with pious prayer than with keenness of intellect, therefore it is impossible for those who rely only on their intellect and rush into Scripture with dirty feet like pigs, as though Scripture were merely a sort of human knowledge not to harm themselves and others whom they instruct. Without prayer, we are damaging ourselves when we engage in scripture. And so again, that, that being sort of the final uh, capstone on how to pray for the church in the world, that, that they would also be in prayer, and that we would be in prayer, because without that, we are in danger, grave danger, because again, the Bible, the scripture, is a sword. And it will pierce any who treat it carelessly. St. Clement of Alexandria says a lot of things and we don't have time. <laughs> Prayers of Thanksgiving. I heard of your faith in Jesus and I do not cease to give thanks for you. I pray that God may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And it's interesting how Paul, whenever he is praying his prayers of Thanksgiving, is reflecting that as he is giving thanks for them, he is himself blessed to remember how God is working, not just in my space right now, but seeing how God is moving elsewhere. And that is, in its own way, um, an encouragement and uh, an edifying um, boost to what he is doing. As I rise from sleep, I thank you, O Holy Trinity, for through your great goodness and patience, you were not angered with me, an idol and sinner an idler and sinner, nor have you destroyed me in my sins, but have shown your usual love for men. And when I was prostrate in despair, you raised me to keep the morning watch and to glorify your power, and now enlighten my mind's eye and open my mouth to study your words and understand your commandments and do your will and sing to you in heartfelt adoration and praise your most holy name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever to the ages and of ages. Amen. And that's where we will end. Amen?
Amen. Thank you. That was a prayer, so. That was <laughs>